Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Ad Tech Tides Are Changing, with TBR Vice President of Research, Stuart Williams, and TBR Senior Analyst, Seth Galinsky. I'm Justin Surgent, and I'll be moderating today's session. Insights from today's presentation are shared from TBR's Digital Advertising Technology Research. If you'd like to learn more about this research, please reach out to myself or one of the analysts after the presentation. Now, before we begin, there are a few items I'd like to cover. First, I'll be recording today's session and posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit this channel to watch this presentation or any of the previous presentations we've posted. Second, I'll be following up, up with all of you via email tomorrow afternoon with the link to today's recording as well as with the slides from today's presentation, so please be on the lookout for that. Finally, we welcome questions from the audience. Please send any questions you have through the Q&A function, and we will address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Now with that, I'd like to hand this over to Seth and Stewart. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. This is Seth Ulinski. Thanks for joining today. Um, so to start off with, just to uh, get everyone on the, the line here who might not be familiar with TBR, we provide business analysis of the IT sector, and we do so across a number of different uh, segments and verticals, um, one of which is digital. So what is digital? The definition depends based on who you're talking to. We started uh, our digital practice about a year and a half ago and decided to look at the customer-facing elements, so the customer continuum is what we've coined it, and really that is being driven largely from the CMO's office, but also CIO and CTOs um, are involved as well. So if we're looking at the customer continuum, starting from left to right here, uh, it begins with ad tech. You can think of that as the tip of the spear, so all the paid media elements involved. Um, within marketing, marketing tech, so that would be more marketing automation, whether that's email marketing, site optimization, um, analytics, th those sorts of things. And then last but not least, services automation. Um, that's more or less the retention, the ongoing dialogue that brands uh, and companies look to have with customers once they've um, kind of gone through the entire funnel, moving from a prospect to a paying customer. Um, so. As far as the, uh, the overarching theme today, we will be talking about ad tech, of course, and whereas the market for 2015 was about $30 billion, uh, based on our estimates, we see that growing to $47 billion in 2016, and that's going to be largely driven by programmatic or the automation that's being driven largely through APIs. Um, I'll let Stuart chime in as well. Thanks, Seth, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, the key trends that we see happening here is that obviously advertising has, has classically been focused on the audience engagement with, uh, with paid, uh, but now we see social ad coming into this and the conversion of those audiences into individuals as leads uh, that then marketing and sales and e-commerce can work to create customers that we then service in the retaining customer segment, uh, service automation portion of this. So, what we're focusing on today, as Seth mentioned, is really how is that landscape of advertisers changing? Where's it going? And maybe do we see some bridges being built with marketing tech? So we'll be sharing a couple of different uh, pieces of our digital portfolio today specific to ad tech, uh, one of which is the vendor benchmark. So as with any benchmark, uh, providing a clear taxonomy is critical. So with that in mind, we have four key segments that we're tracking demand-side platforms or the platforms that are really uh, leading the buying of, uh, of media and data on behalf of agencies, brands, and trading desks, ad exchanges. These are the programmatic marketplaces that connect the buyers and sellers of data and media. Hybrid platforms, these are vendors that uh, really play to both sides of the equation if you're looking at demand and supply. And then last but not least, demand-side platforms. These are um, the, the data specialists and in some cases peer plays that are really we view as kind of being the connective tissue as, uh, as Stuart was alluding to between ad tech and martech. Um, so that's just a, an overview of the taxonomy specific to the benchmark. So looking into the benchmark and the actual coverage, um, you can see a list of the vendors here. Um, the various segments, again, there are four segments we're tracking. Some of the key metrics that we're looking at include net revenue. So one interesting element about ad tech is people, I think, confuse 
uh, gross revenues with the actual software as a service and managed services revenue. So with that in mind, our benchmark does kind of tease out the managed media, traffic acquisition, and any other kind of pass-through elements that really don't um, drive the revenue, so to speak, or represent revenue. And as far as the, uh, the other breakouts, software as a service and managed services, uh, those are two other cuts we, we provide. And then from an operational standpoint, looking at profitability. So increasingly profitability is a, uh, a hot button as we've seen a couple of key vendors trim back their headcount recently in pursuit of becoming more profitable. Uh, we're also looking at revenue per employee, revenue per client. And then as far as the time periods, we provide a couple of different uh, look back periods. Um, and then it's also worth noting, um, this is specific to the benchmark. If you look in italics, these are vendors that we've covered in another piece of collateral uh, through our uh, ad tech vendor portfolio series. And these are exclusive, more deep dive looks at a particular vendor, uh, really looking at their go-to-market strategy, their, uh, the way they support clients, alliances, footprints, those sorts of things. Um, and really interesting to kind of compare and contrast those versus the benchmark. And then our uh, third piece of research we'll look at today, which is the uh, customer, the end buying behavior research. So this is an excerpt from the 2Q15 ad tech vendor benchmark. And what you're looking at here um, is basically all of the ad tech revenue for second quarter for all of the benchmark vendors. Um, that includes advertising um, or media that's driven from advertising, in the case of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, there are two new players that we added to the benchmark. The rationale there is they're really behaving much more like a lot of the ad tech vendors here, providing buying opportunities not just on their owned properties, but also through uh, APIs and ad exchanges, extending their reach to other properties, uh, allowing them to capitalize on more revenue opportunities. Um, but again, this, this slide here shows all of the revenues attributed to their ad tech. The two caveats being uh, Adobe as well as Marin Software. The reason we didn't include all of their uh, managed media was because they have literally billions of dollars in keyword ad budgets that they're managing. So that would kind of skew the, uh, the graph here. And we really wanted to be able to kind of encapsulate all the vendors on, on one view here. Um, but as far as looking at the axes, if you look at the Y axes, that's the operating margin versus the x-axis. That's year-to-year uh, -year revenue growth for the second quarter. One of the keys that we see here, Seth, and I think it's most interesting when we started looking at pulling out the revenue associated just with the tech platforms is that you know, Facebook has so successfully uh, really entering and dominating this space. They're, they're, the, the ownership that they have of the data for the people on Facebook, what they call people-based marketing, is really a huge lever for them that they can use to, to drive advertising all over the Internet, um, not just on the, the Facebook page. And the way that they use that uh, platform to place advertising both you know, on the Facebook page and off the page um, is, is a huge advantage for them um, and one that we see very closely tied only to their content. So it's a little bit of a closed garden, and they're beginning to close off the rest of the ecosystem access to that um, as well. And that's a trend that, that we see happening uh, in this consolidation of the market. It's not just about the technology, but about the connection to the content. Um, you'll see some other players in here. You know, AOL with, with Millennial Media uh, is in there. We're also starting to look at AT&T with its connection to DirecTV. Um, as, a, as a lead for a uh, landing place for ad tech. Uh, and there's a, there's a host of other vendors that are examining or looking at this space uh, in how they create the support for those content-led platforms. So as we kind of peel back the onion and we remove um, what I would view as some of the, the elements that inflate revenues for some of the ad tech vendors, including managed media, traffic acquisition costs, and the like, you can note here that Facebook is still the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Again, we're looking at second quarter 2015 revenues. Um, the same, same things hold true for the axes here as far as operating margin versus year-to-year -year growth. Um, interesting to look at Oracle as far as their growth. So certainly data as a service is going to be one of their big talking points and key themes for 2016. Uh, very similar, Twitter 
by licensing their, uh, their data and being able to partner with a, an organization like IBM. So uh, you're looking at 10,000 IBM consultants in market selling Twitter's data um, to their clients. So that's an excellent channel sales partner to have on your side. Um, and then if you look at Google, Google would certainly have a bigger sphere here um, and probably stack up fairly well against Facebook. But we were able to really um, delineate and, and call out their different business units. Uh, so that, that uh, is something to consider here as well. Um, and then it should be noted, AOL Millennial Media, while you know, they have a, a massive presence here, still not profitable uh, consistently. So we'll see what happens with Verizon's resources and, and how they kind of um, integrate those two units and also look to, to kind of leverage the subscriber base of Verizon, um, in particular the 110 subscriber, million subscriber base that they have here in the U.S. So as we mentioned, the, uh, the, the title here, Ad Tech Tides Are Changing, and as we mentioned, media heavyweights, uh, we're referring to companies like, <clears throat> excuse me, Twitter and Facebook in particular entering the mix. So these are the five uh, key themes that we'll touch on today. There's roughly one or two slides to support each one of these themes. So number one, competition intensifies and diversifies. So um, as we mentioned, you have some of these media technology firms uh, where Twitter and Facebook used to be social companies, they're increasingly more of these um, end-to-end ad tech vendors, and you could even call them media technology players as well. So they're going head-to-head -head with enterprise marketing clouds and also the pure plays. Number two, we're looking at the data management platforms. Again, those are increasingly critical to this integration between ad tech and martech stacks where organizations are really trying to create that unified view of the customer. Number three, advanced analytics. You could look at this as almost an extension of the DMP, but really advanced analytics such as attribution are so specialized. Um, and for the most part, they live outside of the DMP, and there's been a whole bunch of acquisitions recently that we'll touch on a little bit later here in the presentation. Number four, ad tech revenues are diversifying. So whereas ad tech was largely um, a very good friend of agency holding companies and, and digital boutiques. Increasingly, we're seeing insourcing by major brands. We're also seeing IT strategy-led vendors and even management consultancies um, help kind of uh, determine where clients are investing in ad tech. And last but not least, adoption of programmatic platforms in TV. So the $200 billion TV, uh, $200 billion TV ad industry has experienced some weakness recently. So we've, if you read the Wall Street Journal, you've heard, you know, Viacom, Discovery Communications, um, a handful of other, what I would call media conglomerates are experiencing weakness. And we'll touch on some of the opportunities for the ad tech vendors there. Thanks, Seth. So, so when I think about what's the net of all of these forces that are, and changes that are happening, we see a uh, huge expansion of the spend uh, going through the technological channel here through the, using these tools, uh, transformation of traditional processes, um, the entrance of new players in this space, the connection to content being very powerful, um, and the fact that the buyers, the enterprises, the brands um, who are, who are the, the ultimate uh, people shelling out the money here are desiring more transparency. You know, there's a dark side to all of this activity. Um, and that really needs to be addressed. You know, there's issues of fraud, issues of uh, viewability, transparency. Uh, the idea of, of people adopting ad blockers is a big uh, uh, worry point, keeping a lot of people awake at night. So one of the things we look at is how are these forces really reshaping the competitive dynamics of the landscape? Where is it going? And, and we're going to touch on where we think, uh, to use a, a northern New England phrase, where is the puck going in this hockey game? So uh, talking in line with the, uh, the first driver, the competitive landscape evolving, as we mentioned, Facebook and Twitter are making massive uh, moves within ad tech and leveraging personally identifiable information. So PII is a hot button for sure. Um, when and where Capitol Hill potentially steps in is to be determined, um, but really 
these vendors need to be cognizant about the, the ultimate end user, right, the consumer, and as Stuart alluded to, ad blockers, that's just one indication that consumers might not be happy with the way things uh, are currently operating. Um, but with that in mind, if we look at the, uh, the 2Q15 net revenues, again, this is pure software as a service or managed services revenue. We see that the total benchmark vendors captured roughly $2 billion in net revenue for 2Q15. And the big four, as we'll refer to them here, they captured roughly 75% of that. So that's a, uh, a massive, massive piece of the pie, so to speak, leaving the remaining quarter for the other startups and growth stage vendors to kind of compete. And from an operating and profit standpoint, um, if you look at what the, uh, the big four did from an operating standpoint uh, for profit, it, it's greater than what the, uh, the total benchmark vendors did. And the, the reason for the decrease there is that these guys are still in, in essentially growth mode and they're spending more than they take in. So um, that's going to be a major pressure point moving forward as a lot of these uh, well-funded private firms look to either go IPO or potentially get acquired. So that, that brings us to the bullets here towards the bottom. Um, and as agencies and brands become more comfortable potentially working with somebody like Facebook as a demand side platform, um, that will put even more pressure on the pure plays. So what does that mean? When you have 1,500 vendors in the ad tech ecosystem, that means that many of them will likely exit under duress. Um, so these are non-favorable conditions where it's either a fire sale, so to speak, or they go out uh, bankrupt. However, there will be some that do well, that um, exit on better terms. These will be the select. So a company uh, like MarketShare, for example, an attribution specialist acquired for $450 million a couple weeks ago by Newstar, that's one example recently of an ad tech vendor um, going out on very favorable terms. Um, and then the last bullet, flourishing with existing business models in pursuit of an IPO. Uh, those will be the elite. So there will not be a whole lot of these companies we don't anticipate in the next uh, year, maybe even year and a half, just given the market conditions and the performance of some of the vendors to date. So um, we'll, we'll touch a little bit more on some of the elite as we go through the, uh, the presentation here. So as the competitive landscape evolves, we thought it would be helpful to share an excerpt from one of the vendor profiles that we mentioned earlier. This is for Facebook. So we created a vendor profile exclu exclusively on Facebook to really showcase what they're doing, how they're making money, and the flow of money through their ecosystem. So you can see here that really Facebook, their, their core driver is this one billion subscriber user base. So these are known people, not proxies such as cookies and device IDs, that they're leveraging to target within their own walled garden, so to speak, but they're also extending their reach through APIs and acquisitions of companies like Atlas and LiveRail to extend that, that audience base where agencies, brands, agency trading desks can now target those same audiences on, say, USA Today or ESPN or Condé Nast uh, properties. So really there's um, an interesting situation here where they're, they have enough momentum and a, a large enough user base where they're attracting buyers as well as sellers of media. And not to pick too hard a, a fight with Facebook, but you know, when you think about the potential abuse uh, that can be leveraged through the Facebook platform, we certainly see the cautious steps uh, that have been made with the rollouts of uh, the, the Facebook platform. Uh, you know, certainly it's important for the Facebook uh, business to make its subscribers, its users comfortable with the platform and that they're not being abused. Now, there is always commentary on Facebook about, you know, protect your privacy, protect your content. They're walking a very, very fine line with getting people uh, used to uh, their, the, being monetized. And, uh, and so the, the, the trend is towards greater degrees of um, breakdown of that privacy shield, you know, and being able, people being able to see more and more about you, uh, at least in aggregate. And that brings up a, a great point if we're looking at the continuum at the bottom. So if we look at 2015 today, 
uh, where Facebook's revenues are largely driven via advertising. It's not a stretch to see them do a, a click to buy um, with e-commerce. And so, like Stuart was mentioning, this whole uh, trust issue, if they are able to uh, build that bond of trust with consumers where you know, they're, they're storing credit card information similar to Amazon, that presents a really, really strong opportunity from an e-commerce standpoint. And they've already made investments in their uh, display ad formats. Um, I'm speaking to Carousel right now where retailers can essentially plug in multiple uh, items within a display unit. And again, moving from you know, just being able to show an advertisement to a one click to purchase, that, that's not a stretch. And then moving forward into 2020, being able to leverage Oculus VR and um, some of the business productivity tools that they're working on, really that could di diversify what they have for a revenue stream today and um, you know, then they start to encroach on folks like Microsoft and get into the world of gaming. So uh, a whole bunch of really interesting avenues that they can pursue here. So the second driver we touched on was data management platforms. And again, we see DMPs being this really integral uh, connection point between ad tech and martech stacks. And of course, the DMP pure plays, so we're talking about Crux, Exalate, Lodeme. These companies are in a great position to, uh, to kind of capitalize on that trend. Maybe not Exalate so much uh, anymore, given that they're now acquired by Nielsen and they're more into the media measurement side of the business, so not sure where, where they'll head long term with that. But certainly the demand side platforms that have made really large investments in DMP functionality, uh, such as Rocket Fuel, for example, they're going to be in a great position when CMOs and CTOs and chief digital officers look to break down these silos that exist today um, between the advertising spend and then the marketing campaigns that are going on to really kind of connect the dots. Um, and not surprisingly, in our 2Q15 ad tech customer research, audience data management was one major uh, pain point for respondents. So um, I think there's still, we're talking about the uh, the brands as a whole, wrapping their arms around what is the, ultimate, uh, the, the optimal data management platform. Um, and we think they're still kind of managing multiple platforms internally. So finding that single source of truth is going to be critical moving forward. So moving back to the benchmark, uh, the DMPs within the benchmark, and again, we have the pure plays here, as well as some of the DSPs that also carry DMP capabilities. Um, you can see that Oracle's far to the right there with a very good size uh, sphere as far as the revenue is concerned. Um, Twitter, as we mentioned, basically opening up their APIs so um, clients can ingest their data is a, uh, a huge opportunity for them. And as we had mentioned before, Rocket Fuel as well, uh, making the most of their acquisition of X plus one. And uh, I should also mention Adobe. So Adobe is kind of uh, behind the rest of those folks there. But Adobe recently launched uh, an audience marketplace very similar to what uh, Oracle has had in market for a few quarters now uh, on the heels of its Blue Kai acquisition. So data as a service we do think will be a huge opportunity um, for those three vendors I just mentioned uh, between Adobe, Twitter, and Oracle, given that they have exchanges. Um, maybe not so much for rocket fuel, where that's more of a first-party data management scenario. So there's been a lot of discussion, and this is pulled from our end-user research for the second quarter. There's been a lot of talk about the, uh, the marketing uh, function as a whole shifting from a cost center to a profit center. And we think that's possible, but it's only possible if you have the right story to tell. And in order to tell the story, you need the data. So if you're going to back it up with data, you need the right tools in place. So we think this is where, um, you know, of course, the DMP comes into play, as well as marketing attribution tools. So really, if you look at today, the vast majority in North America here um, of respondents indicate that marketing, advertising, and PR is viewed as a, a cost center. Counterparts in EMEA, maybe a little bit more forward thinking, maybe a little bit more ahead of the curve as far as um, that shift in moving marketing from a cost center to a profit center. Um, but what we should note here is that 
there are a lot of organizations that want to move forward with that uh, with that push and, and kind of transitioning to more of a, uh, a profit center. Yeah, Seth, we think that this is, you know, an, an ultimate outcome for enterprises as as they reexamine um, the engagement functions and you know, we the customer engagement from advertising, marketing, sales. You know, you think about and service as you think about that as a lifetime cycle. Um, why wouldn't a CEO begin to look at all of those functions as the core to to their business, right? That's where you generate revenue, and everything back behind that inside the enterprise are operations. That's how you create value for the customer, but the customer perception is all about the experience of your product or service. Uh, so thinking about this function for marketing sales, this whole customer continuum as a profit center is a big psychological shift. Um, most, as we see here, most North American companies still think of marketing as a, as a cost center. Um, we believe that smart advertisers and marketers, uh, sales organizations and service organizations should work together and get this on the perspective of the CEO because ultimately the CEO is responsible for, for the overall performance of the company. So this is really a CEO issue, not just one for marketers uh, or people in that function. So as we mentioned uh, earlier, advanced analytics and, and we're speaking about marketing attribution here in particular have been a hot button and don't listen to me or trust me, just look at the four companies here that have made some pretty major acquisitions over the past year, year and a half between Oracle, Google, AOL, and Newstar. Um, so with Oracle, it was interesting. It was more of a, we want to be able to measure offline purchases and then marry that back to online uh, ad exposures and, and digital campaigns. So that's, that's one way to kind of connect the dots. With Google and AOL, the companies they acquired, it was more of a online uh, attribution, so being able to measure cross-channel, cross-device, and see where the biggest lift or the biggest impact was occurring uh, during the course of the campaign. And very similar with Newstar, so that was the most recent acquisition, as I said, maybe two weeks ago, uh, for $450 million, and I believe their revenues uh, were sub-$100 million, so that's a pretty nice multiple from that standpoint. As far as acquisition pr predictions, everybody likes to pontificate and look into the crystal ball. So um, there are some independent pure plays left, definitely not as many as there were, say, 12 months ago. Um, these are just four organizations that we think have pretty good scale and a position in the market. Uh, so Conversion Logic, C3 Metrics, Insight, and, and Visual IQ. And then you've got to look at who's potentially going to pick these, uh, these vendors up. Oracle Data Cloud, as I mentioned, Data Logics kind of measures the offline purchase component, so they still don't yet have the multi-channel digital uh, measurement piece. So, you know, adding any one of those vendors just mentioned would be a nice complement or supplement to what they currently have. SAP Hybris, Teradata, Facebook potentially, even though they do own media properties and some view that as kind of a, a taboo um, thing when you're looking at a marketing attribution tool. Um, IBM certainly with their big data presence and data management uh, capabilities as well as the marketing cloud would make sense. And last but not least, Nielsen. Even though they have a number of tools, they really don't have that silver bullet as far as being able to measure cross-device and um, include something such as viewability. So diversified revenue streams, as we mentioned before, Ad tech revenues are still largely driven by the agencies and the holding companies in particular. Um, however, there's been more of an appetite by brands internally as they seek to either drive media efficiencies or get closer to the data or the business intelligence that's being driven from ad tech to bring tools in-house. Um, so this is a snapshot from our second quarter uh, end user research. And again, you're looking at um, Roughly 40, we'll say 50% are doing everything in-house versus the remaining 50% doing some kind of a combination or with 19% um, exclusively executing campaigns through an agency. So those are just, um, you know, two buyers of ad tech, so to speak. But as we mentioned, the, uh, the streams are diversifying, which brings us into the next slide here. 
Um, so if you look at the left-hand side, and these are the ad tech business influencers that we've identified, and on the left-hand side, again, the media agencies really being the legacy business drivers for ad tech vendors, as well as um, the client direct or insourcing um, scenarios where brands are bringing in-house a couple of examples of key players um, with the media agencies, Razorfish, Digitas, uh, the agency holding companies are, are definitely making the, uh, the lion's share of investments here today. But you're also seeing major brands, not just smaller direct response uh, brands like in the past that might have used ad tech in-house. We're talking about big global brands, Kellogg's, Netflix, Ford, Procter & Gamble. Um, so those are, are kind of the legacy side. And then we have new entrants. So from a services standpoint, um, the management consultancies where they're really good at driving this digital process transformation, um, they do have a leg to stand on when they're talking about mixing it up a, uh, a business or an organization from a people and platform standpoint, trying to drive efficiencies. So McKinsey, BCG, BAME, these are some of the companies that have ramped up their digital marketing services uh, camps, and they're even looking at creative elements now. So they're, they're not just focused on the dollars and cents and, and kind of whiteboarding things. They're also getting into the creative aspects. IT services, even more so. Accenture uh, Interactive, Deloitte Digital, IBM. These companies or these firms have all made massive investments in their digital marketing services capabilities. They've acquired boutique shops. They have really strong analytical shops to begin with. Um, they're all about platforms. They have um, strong DNAs and uh, systems integration and big data and analytics, which really plays into this whole new digital uh, landscape in the, uh, the data-driven economy. This is, this is a not surprising conclusion when you look at the convergence of all of these different firms into this space. The entrance of all the new money being spent by advertiser marketing, by the brands and the internal functions, uh, the need for them to capitalize on this to capture revenue uh, in a slow growth economy uh, really puts a lot of pressure on these firms to begin to diversify. We do not yet see a dominant business model among the service firms, nor do we see any one particular vendor, you know, truly trumping the others uh, in this in this space. Um, our colleague Boz Christoph uh, has recently done a couple of webinars on the performance of the services vendors in the space, a good name to look up. Um, but we do see this interconnection between the firms that are doing the strategy, making the recommendation for the tech platforms. So there's a need for strong alliances and support there, uh, particularly between the more the pure play technology vendors and the consulting firms. But also the content-led vendors are gonna need platforms as well, uh, some of which are gonna wanna acquire. Uh, but many of whom probably don't want to be in the don't want to be in the business of owning a tech platform, but they're going to need one. So uh, powerful, powerful plays still yet to be made in this space. And, and you know, to add on to uh, to Stuart's comment, my my colleague Boz and I will actually be putting out a, uh, a commentary on Publicis's uh, recent reorg, as well as Turn's announcement uh, in reduction of headcount and a little bit of a pivot or a shift from their uh, their SaaS-led business to doing more of a hybrid uh, managed services um, delivery model. So the last driver we'll talk about today is programmatic TV. Again, we're talking about the shift from linear programming, um, you know, kind of old school TV. They determine when you watch and schedule and so forth to more on-demand formats, video, over-the-top technologies, and that is definitely disrupting, as I mentioned before, the $200 billion TV ad industry, and this creates a massive uh, new opportunity for not only the ad tech players to help the, uh, the legacy TV industry become digitized, but also the service players that are doing the heavy lifting from a, services, uh, from a system in integration standpoint and kind of leading the strategy from an IT uh, perspective. So today, there's roughly 10% or less of this linear inventory that's available through programmatic channels. There's a lot of beta testing, research, proof of concepts going on. Um, there have been a couple of key announcements recently. So Dish Network announced an alliance or an integration with Two Mogul, Rocket Fuel, and DataZoo, where uh, the clients of those three DSPs can actually purchase Dish Network 
uh, inventory through those platforms. So that's a great example of some early thought leadership and moves in the market. Um, we do anticipate seeing more of that, but again, it's going to take a team effort from the systems integrators, the, uh, the inventory owners, the cable operators, um, and of course, the, uh, the dollars from the CMOs and uh, those, those budgets being allocated prop, uh, accordingly. So moving into the more mature side of the curve here, um, that's where the real operational efficiencies and the workflows are going to see improvements for both the buyers and sellers. And then what you're ultimately going to have is if you are planning media cross-channel, cross-device, a lot of the complexities that exist today um, are going to be uh, not totally removed, but reduced significantly, and you're going to have a better idea of that true reach and frequency that you just don't have today. Um, but all this is going to be necessary as the marketers and, and uh, brands really push towards that um, customer continuum and, and data-driven marketing. Um, so, what does programmatic TV look like? We thought we'd pull another excerpt from one of the vendor profiles within AdTech. So this is one for two mobiles. So they are uh, one of the forward-leaning ad tech vendors that specialize in programmatic uh, video. And if you're looking from top to bottom, you can think of the top as kind of the, the buy side and then flowing through down to the, uh, the inventory sources. So um, key capabilities include today planning, execution, and measurement. Some of the growth drivers, data-driven advertising, as we mentioned before, programmatic ad tech, so this notion of real-time bidding. And programmatic also means just simply the, the automation of what were historically you know, manually led processes by people. Um, they will still be led by people, but they're using platforms um, instead of picking up the phone or using email in, in some cases. So as far as the programmatic TV alliances that Two Mobile has today, highlighted a couple of those there on the right-hand side, Wide Orbits, Clipped, Audience Express. And these firms are either working with the, uh, the inventory supplies or the audiences and making them addressable through programmatic buying, um, such as a Two Mobile. Um, if we look at the bottom, the continuum, so today largely, Two mobiles focused on desktop video formats for 2016. We see that shifting quickly to mobile video. And then by 2020, there will be, have been done a lot of heavy lifting and integration and other legwork to enable the programmatic TV buying that we're talking about. Yeah, this isn't just you know, about programmatic TV placement uh, or watching time shifting video. This is really about the placement of video as advertising content of insights around the consumption of that, around uh, the, the second screen experience, you know, where people are looking, watching uh, time shifting uh, over the top video to their big screens at home and then doing individual experiences with additional cutscenes or advertising segments inside of this. You know, truly creating value and experiences around this uh, requires the delivery platforms, the monetization platforms, and the creative uh, and we see, we see firms really making some strides in these areas, uh, but we think that as the market really, television market really shifts into a fully digitized form, there is, there's vast amounts of room for improvement uh, in the consumption and experience of, uh, of television. All right. How about some questions? All right, so just a reminder, if you have any questions, please send them to the Q&A function. We prefer that over the chat function. It's just a lot easier for us to sort through on our end here. Um, and with that, let's start with what has been sent through already. Um, <clears throat> first question, which vendors do you see going public? Uh, Justin, uh, tough question, but a good question. So there, there's been no lack of, um, uh, I guess, rumor mill material going out there regarding AppNexus. So for those who aren't familiar, AppNexus is one of the hybrid vendors that we do cover. So they have the programmatic ad tech or infrastructure that supports uh, both ad exchanges as well as demand side platforms. So they're really kind of this next gen ad server, if you will. Um, they have some really unique alliances going on, one with Microsoft, where they are providing the backbone for Microsoft's inventory, um, not domestically, because that's currently held by AOL, but 
Um, I believe throughout most of Europe, um, that that's uh, a really interesting alliance where um, AppNexus is kind of serving up the programmatic platform for, for Microsoft. In addition to that, I would have said Turn up until recently, but Turn just announced some layoffs, so they're clearly not doing quite as well as, um, as I had thought initially, but that doesn't mean there's room for improvement down the road and they can't uh, kind of right the ship, so to speak. But um, yeah, I would say AppNexus is probably the closest to, uh, to going public. All right, uh, next question. Could you provide a little more commentary on Publicis and Turn? Great question. So Publicis, interesting. I would say they, they had an appetite for acquiring ad tech a few quarters ago. Um, they were at least kicking the tires with Critio, which is one of the vendors we cover. But as far as what they're doing, I really think they're trying to kind of mirror what an IT services-led vendor has done, such as Accenture Interactive, um, setting up um, more defined uh, business units to better support their clients and, and just create more clearly uh, defined business units in general so people can identify who does what versus this family of agencies that's a kind of a hodgepodge almost, uh, a bunch of fiefdoms, if you will. Um, what was the other side of it? Uh, let's just, could you provide uh, more commentary on Publicis and Turn? Oh, and Turn. Um, so yeah, Turn, I think Turn is experiencing, just based on, on what I've read, experiencing what maybe some, even, even some of the large legacy vendors uh, have experienced, such as Oracle and Adobe, which is a software as a service model requires massive scale um, as far as profitability is concerned and maybe they're a little bit ahead of the market as far as all the features and functions and being able to kind of hand the keys over to clients um, where clients are more comfortable and the real demand is still in a managed services capacity. So um, that's one of the reasons we actually wanted to carve out managed services versus software as a service vendor revenues in our benchmark because it really is an interesting uh, scenario. Yeah, the, and I think the, the, the publicist shift, the, the reorganization follows a, um, you know, one of the challenges with, with it being a holding company is, is the partner organization and the buyouts of the existing partners, the way that, you know, they um, need to manage their transitions is slightly different than the way the traditional IT Centric firms will, will make an acquisition, make some offers to retain key employees, but they're essentially acquiring the everything kit and caboodle, uh, whereas the agency models really uh, are, need to be much more concerned about client retention and, and other elements um, as that, that business can shift quickly, as we've seen with the agency review. So it, it does make sense that, you know, after the big acquisition last year, that there was a kind of a cooling off period, hand holding period, and now we're starting to see the announcement of of changes that begin to align their assets more uh, with each other and with the market opportunities. So uh, we think it's natural. We also think that uh, um, it aligns with some of the way that other vendors are, are playing in the market. So uh, for those folks who are on the, on the line, stay tuned. We're uh, going to publish a, a note on those changes shortly. Take the top question there. All right. Um, in addition to TubeMogul, who do you see as the leaders in the programmatic TV space? Great question. It depends. Are you talking about the buy side or the supply side? So from the buy side, you would certainly have to say uh, to Mogul, uh, Videology is a specialist there, um, Uyala is another that actually they operate on the demand and supply side. So in that regard, they're a little bit like AppNexus. Um, who else? So it, as far as just the, the core infrastructure and helping aggregate inventory on the supply side, Clipped would be another one. Uh, they're based in Boston here, so those are some of the, the ones that just kind of come top of mind. All right, uh, the next question. Do you see um, other consolidation happening between MarTech and AdTech, other than the Oracle Blue Kai combo? Sure. Um, well, what I would like to see is, is a couple of the demand side platforms get acquired because I think the media buying component is is definitely needed, especially for, say, an Oracle Marketing Cloud. I think that's one element that they do not have currently, um, and there's a number of, of very innovative, uh, multifaceted, multi-channel vendors in market that are that are private today. Um, 
in addition to that, SAP Hybris, I think they would benefit from, um, again, a, uh, a media buying element being, being uh, bolted on to what they have. Um, and then as I mentioned before, the, the marketing attribution, so if you consider marketing attribution ad tech, then certainly there's, there's a couple of uh, vendors in market that, that would be nice add-ons to some of the enterprise marketing clouds today. All right. Sorry. Yeah, and, and so when we think about this, this integration, we're thinking about this in many ways, the way that um, a lot of the enterprises are thinking about broader application landscapes. So there's a lot of consolidation of underlying platforms. And this is the key to the data, data platforms, um, the challenge of managing, integrating, and getting insight from your first, second, third-party data at each step as the customer moves through what we call that customer continuum. So when they're unidentified, they're in the audience, when they're in the marketing funnel, when they're in the sales and commerce stages of becoming a customer, when they are a customer, you know, being able to get to them, give them contextually accurate, insightful, helpful information across that, and to be able to get an aggregate analytics of the performance and the return on investment when you make these, these efforts to reach out to people. This is a transformation of this entire engagement cycle. It's why we talked about this earlier as, um, you know, the customer market, the customer-facing piece. So great, when we think about the vendors in this space, there's, there are vendors who are starting to uh, roll up and create portfolios on the marketing tech side, the big, you know, big four. There's other vendors that are starting to roll up on the advertising side. There is a natural break uh, between the paid and earned and owned <coughs> uh, sides of it. So there may be some alliances driven behavior. I think it's Seth called out, but we think there's room for one or two of the tech titans to really make a move here and go all in and, and buy up some platforms here. Uh, they may not monetize all of it, but the data flow becomes incredibly valuable to large enterprises over a, over a life cycle. So think about that. All right. It looks like we only have one last question in the queue here. Um, can you name some of the vendors you see exiting under duress? Oh, it's painful. <laughs> I, I love all ad tech vendors. Um, like, which one of your children do you not like the most? I don't know. Uh, Tough question. So if you look at the, some of the, we'll say, ad tech vendors that went public earlier, and I won't name any names, but some of the early movers, um, say two to three years ago, they're probably not doing so hot. Um, Marin Software has not been profitable in any quarter yet. Uh, they are definitely burning some, some cash, and there have been a number of uh, executives that have left recently, including their uh, VP of marketing. So I would say that they might be in uh, fire sale mode, so to speak. And you know, a lot of these companies that are that are uh, privately held, I think they're starting to approach the end of their runway, so to speak. If you look at what uh, news hit the press today regarding Turn um, and their reduction of headcount, that's fairly telling. That um, you know they're uh, they're they're feeling the pressure and. We'll see what happens. They they do have, I believe it's 25 million in the bank still, but um, you know burn rates are are pretty significant, and these guys are are being asked to show profits. So sooner than later, we shall see a few more exit here. And it's a it's a beautiful dichotomy. On the one hand, you have this shift towards tech-driven platforms, uh, now the where the money is starting to really flow in. And it's inevitable that there's going to be increase in, in revenue spent here. We might just be waiting for the video shift because that's, there's a lot more revenue there. And you know, looking at the vendors who could be better positioned to do this. So the performance of the vendors to date has been about grabbing share and using you know, their revenue flows and their investments to, to grow the footprint of their business, not necessarily to show profit. So the, the, is the inflection point there for, for that for some of them to get the scale? Yes but there is going to be a shakeout. All right, well, that looks like that's all we have for questions today. So I'd like to thank Stuart and Seth for your presentation today, and thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. You can follow the analysts as well as TBR on Twitter at the handles listed here, and please check out our pages on SlideShare and YouTube to view some of our previously aired webinars. Additionally, as you sign off, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. 
We ask you please fill that out, send us any questions, comments, anything you want. Uh, we read that and we're always looking to improve our presentations here from that feedback. So we'll leave the chat function open for another moment or so for people to ask any last minute questions. Otherwise, thank you for joining and have a great afternoon.